All right, we're going to go ahead and get started, and I'm going to um, continue this. I want to say this right now, but <laughs> I could change. But I get home tonight, I don't know. But we're still doing the Jesus Perfect Theology. This is part seven, and um, we're going to do part two of a more Christ-like Bible. And um, there's some more things. And the reason why I want to continue this, this is too big of a, a shift, a paradigm shift for the traditional church. To, um, I mean, I, I, I just really, in the last, what, seven weeks now, um, just dumped a truckload of change. I mean, a huge shift of how to um, look at the Old Testament, where we were raised for most of our Christian life, reading it a certain way. And then old Jesus comes along and puts a cramp in the whole thing when he says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So now we got to go back and reinterpret the Old Testament through the lens of Christ. And uh, that's going to change some things. And some people are not ready for that. And um, But because the Bible is the, the, key, the key thing we use in church, when we preach and we teach, we share, everybody's, you know, the Bible is that, that source. So I feel like because it's so important to us, the Bible, um, I want to continue this and then try to be more practical because the worst is over. The hard part's over um, and what we've done. What I want to do now is bring it more in a sim simplistic way to where when you're reading the Old Testament or even the New because you got the book of Revelation to deal with now. We haven't even looked at that yet. Um, but looking at the Old Testament give you some practical ways and means to some things here that might make sense and um, and little by little this will open up to you and you know if I can use what you said was that last week or the week before where I got it you just I got it yeah so it's going to take a while I'm still learning and I'm still seeing things even even in this little study here tonight um, I had some more clarity so um, I want to do that. I probably my, my plan is to do this at least for um, June and July, and um, and maybe not. I don't know. I'm just saying it's too big of a paradigm shift just to just go on to the next, you know. So anyway, um, so I want to share with you a little bit of my journey for for two three minutes because it's something that I'm looking back on and, and I'm getting. There's a lot of things God's going to show you, and you're going to be in the dark. You're like, I, I don't know what this means. Something's happening. I don't know what it is. And you may not know it for a month, a year, or a decade. That's just how God works. And I've had this encounter since the late 80s. And I, it really isn't anything that I should have paid too much attention to because I didn't have the, the grid to, to know what was going on or the language or the revelation to even deal with it. Looking back now, I see what was going on. But in the time that these things, hit, these encounters or awakenings, whatever you want to call them, that I've had, I, they now make sense. Like, for instance, in the, I can only say like in the mid to late 80s is when they really started. And I, rem and, and I shared a little bit of this before. I don't know if you will remember it or not. But I remember one in particular newsletter from David Wilkerson. I don't even know what it was about, but the title said nothing but Christ. And I probably still have that newsletter somewhere, but I don't. it really didn't matter what he said. The title itself, something inside of me, I was probably 24 years old at the time, something inside of me just went, that, that title says it all. And then I'm sure whatever he said, you know, backed that up, and that was the title. Whether he had the new covenant message or not, probably didn't, but didn't matter. But he was he was saying everything is about Jesus, so it seemed to be Christ Christological, in at least in title. Then um, that was like mid '80s, and then he came out with another one, Christ Alone, and he was kind of like really getting into to that. It seems like, and um, and they were resonating with my spirit. Now what, like I said, I don't even know what he said in the newsletter, but my spirit was saying Amen to the titles. That's all you need to know. So then in the early 90s, I got a book by Watchman Nee, and I don't even remember the book, but I remember it coming in the mail, and I went upstairs, um, this is like 93, I think, and I, I, 
I get get to sit down and open the thing up in the first chapter. I'm reading through it, the first couple of paragraphs. And he makes this statement. Christ is the sum of all things. Now this is in the first page, first paragraph. And something within me went, whoa. Just I, I, closed, I didn't even read the book. Can't tell you if I ever picked it back up again. Because just that one statement just undid me. Now I can't give language to that. I couldn't tell you why something went off in me when I read that. And then another time I read something of him that says Christ must have preeminence in all things. Now this is scriptures. Some of all things is uh, um, Ephesians 1. Christ um, preeminence in all things is what Colossians 1 or 2 or something like that. But the, when these things come at you and someone's either speaking it or you're reading it, something inside is like, stop, pay attention. This is what it's all about. But I didn't have the, the understanding to pay attention to. Like, if I could today, I'm like, okay, this is, I need to stop everything and get into a Christocentric Christology, make everything about, but I didn't have that understanding. I just knew in my, in my inner witness, this stuff was happening. So, I probably had a half a dozen, if not a little more, of these types of encounters along the way about Christ. And of course, I just amended it because I thought, well, it is about Jesus. But, I, but something more deeper was going on in my spirit than what my mind was picking up on, or through the Holy Spirit. But anyway, so it wasn't in the last ten years where um, this term, Christocentric, or Christology, um, started coming up in some of the things I was hearing from people and books I was reading. And then all of a sudden, when I got that understanding, um, it just, no wonder, you know. So I know that, and let me, let me write a word, and I, and I may not spell this right, it's, it's either O or, um, now this is Christo, Christ, Telic is the Telos that we looked at last week. If you remember what Telos is, it's the end, it's the goal. And when you use this word, when you're reading the Bible, the whole goal of the Old Testament had, everything that was going on had an end. It was like God had an end game. This is my goal. You can read and say, oh, we're going to talk about the flood. We're going to talk about creation. We're going to talk. And we make all these big deals about all this stuff along the way and forget that God's going somewhere with all this. And we're majoring on the minors. And so if you look at Christ as the end game, the end goal, then you're going to now have to go back and start reading the Bible with only Christ in view or in your mind. So you, like, if you could put on Jesus lens, now you're reading everything in view of Jesus. That's what that means. It's, the, it's all about him. Now I want to read something to you that um, it's a little lengthy. I probably should have made copies of this. If you do, I can email them to you if you want this. I can't remember who did this. I just remember for copying it and sticking it on my notes. Um, so whoever, hey, I did that. Well, I don't know who did it. Can't give you credit because I didn't write down who did it. I know I didn't. Let's put it that way. Now listen to this. Now I know you, even if you don't get all of this, just listen to what you can get. That's, that's how I do most of the things anyway. All right. When New Testament writers, New Testament writers or speakers cited Old Testament passages, they never parsed the original Hebrew or the Septuagint Greek for the audience, nor did they exegete the passage for grammatical or historical context. They had no discernible rules to which they had to strictly adhere when interpreting the Bible. Now, these are the New Testament writers. Astonishingly, they often avoided context and human authorial intent altogether. Um, what did they do with Old Testament passages they cited? Because that's what you, when you read the Old Testament, you got, what are you going to do with them, right? He said, they allegorized them. They updated them. And they improvised them to align with God's Christological love and light. In short, they violated most every interpretive rule taught today by seminaries. This I know because I attended one such seminary. So whoever this was, he went to seminary. <laughs> All right, it's not me. 
The New Testament speakers and writers instead practice um, pneumatic exegesis, also known as spiritual reading. You know, allegorizing, spiritual reading. Every scripture got rerouted to the real relevance and revelation of Christ. Let me say that again. Every scripture got rerouted to the relevance and revelation of Christ. Even if in so doing, the original Old Testament passage had to be semantically shaved or paired of some of its literal literal literality. Jesus and Paul were the two great giants of allegorical reading. Jesus frequently allegorized the Old Testament. Now, I want to say something because this is what happened to me. When I was younger and reading and studying and going to school and everything that I did to get where I had to get to get um, with the license and the ordaining and the credentials, the whole thing. So I had to do all this studying. And one of the things uh, that I got caught up in was dispensationalism. It doesn't matter whether you know what that is. But it's a group, it's, it's a mindset, and they warned us. They warned us about spiritualizing the scriptures about allegorizing the scriptures because you can make them say anything you want well don't you think that they're, they're doing that today taking it literal they're making it say anything you want so nevertheless that's dispensationalism because that's a mindset it's a western mindset and it's it gets into all kinds of crazy other things that um, I don't subscribe to anymore but nevertheless they warned you that you've got to take that thing all the way literal unless it's just stupid like pluck your eye out cut your hand off if it offends you all right but you go to the book of revelation that whole thing is metaphors and, and types and shadows you got to allegorize and paul and this is what he's saying jesus and paul took their liberties to allegorize it and then the, the first century church from gregory of nisa gregory Naz nazazans or whatever how you pronounce that um um, or uh, origin, even Augustine from the West, all these guys spiritualized, allegorized, meaning that when you got to a text that, that made God look like a monster, that he was evil, that he, he's killing, he's murdering, he's things that's not Jesus, then you got to go and you got to spiritualize it and find out, and we'll talk about this in the weeks to come, how to allegorize. Okay? So that's why I say I want to make this practical. I, I can just say that, but Really, you're going to go do that unless I show you how um, ways in, that, that it's done. So he said, Jesus and Paul were the two great giants of allegorical reading. Jesus frequently allegorized the Old Testament. Using key imagery from Old Testament passages, which many only see as literal historical events, Jesus would shave and pair um, their literal meaning into an allegorical application toward himself. He referred, and, and he's going to give you some some ways that how Jesus allegorized the Old Testament. You ready for this? You may want to take these notes because this is nowhere on your outline. And if you want this, I can I can email it to you. So you just got to let me know if you want it or not. Um, for instance, you would go to the Old Testament and see that there's a literal temple, right? Building, right? Jesus referred to himself as the temple of God, the true manna from heaven. He says, I'm that manna from heaven. You saw literal manna coming down out of the sky into the, in, onto the ground. I, I am that man. He's, he, he spiritualized it. Okay? He spirit, he's spiritualizing the temple. He's spiritualizing the manna. Um, Jacob's, that ladder, Jacob's ladder, that's him. He's spiritualizing that. These are all scriptures. He cites these as scriptures. And the, the son of Jonah spiritualized that. The burning bush, he says, I am that burning bush in Exodus 3, and the great shepherd of Psalm 23, he's that. The brazen serpent that God told Moses to put up on a stick, Jesus said, that's me. So we're not looking at literal stuff anymore. And we took Paul, who says that rock was Christ, and all through the Old Testament, we, like the two disciples in the road to Emmaus, never probably even entertained the idea that that rock was Jesus until somebody comes along and says, hey, you got to read this thing differently. Can't, there, there's, there's something going on here we need to know. We need to read it differently. Um, so, and, and, and there's more. But he says, now we know that Jesus is literally nowhere. Now listen to this. Jesus is literally capitalized. Nowhere explicitly to be found by name in the Old Testament. So what do you do with that? 
but allegorically, he's all through it. Make sense? He is everywhere to be found. Jesus allegorized the scriptures to these two highly blessed disciples, and their hearts burned. He's talking about the two on the road to Emmaus. And their hearts burned within them as they finally understood the true importance of the Old Testament. Paul was clear that the Old Testament literal events were prophetic prefigures or rough types. I ain't got much left. Um, of later New Testament reality revealed in and through Jesus Christ who fills all things. Paul um, frequently established his, this divine dynamic. He wrote the biblical revelations occur first in the natural New Testament and then the truer, deeper meanings of which are then unveiled in Scripture in the, um, in the Old Testament. Let's look at some examples. Um, the literal foreskin circumcision in the old, old becomes spiritual heart. It's not the outer flesh, right, of circumcision. He says it's the heart. So he spiritualizes that. And um, keeping the literal Sabbath in the Old Testament instead of, now this is Paul allegorizing, keeping uh, the literal Sabbath in the Old Testament versus the spiritual Sabbath of abiding in divine rest in the New Testament. The law written on literal tablets of stone in the old becomes the law of Christ's love written in, on spiritual tablets of our heart. And again, like I said, the rock. So there's other ones. The Israelites' literal baptism of walking through the waters of the Red Sea in the Old Testament becomes a type of our spiritual baptism in the Red Sea of Jesus' saving blood in the New Testament. The literal temple in the old becomes a spiritual temple of living bodies in the new. And the list goes on and on. In short, and he's done here, they read Old Testament passages. They were inspired or they were inspirited to intuit the better meaning as it related to Christ. Those were the good old days of, unle he calls it, unleavened reading. And I think this was Richard Murray now that I was reading this. So i um, pretty sure it was him. Anyway, I, I, I just, just want you to see that when you're reading the Old Testament now, you've got to put on a new, a new different lens. Okay, so um, let's look at this. The Bible is about two things. To really simplify from the Genesis to Revelation, the Bible is about two things. All right, and that is man's fallen humanity. That's where sin comes from. Man's fallen humanity, the state of humanity, broken and broken in his understanding or his image of who God is. Okay? He's fallen, he's, he, his understanding is darkened, results in not knowing God, not knowing himself, and then sinning and bringing in all the evil that's in the world today. The other thing is that Jesus comes and restores our humanity in his incarnation and recovers the true meaning of who the Father is. That's the only, if you, if you want to simplify what this whole Bible is about, this whole, this whole work, this whole this is the sacred text, it's about man and his fallenness and his sinfulness in that he rejected God in his darkened understanding, walked away, and then in his walking away, he doesn't know who God is anymore. And Jesus comes to restore who God is and to restore his identity in God in creation, who God was, who God created us to be, and um, so here's here here here. If you want me to simplify it even more, the Bible's about two things: God and you. Right? Think about it. If you really want to simplify, now there's all kinds of things that's all around there, like you know every every doctor that's in there. But you got to keep, if you keep it down to this, that this Bible is about God unveiling himself, and in unveiling himself, he unveils who you truly are in him, and you're on your way. Everything else is secondary. It doesn't matter if you understand everything about the book of Revelation. It doesn't matter if we understand how the devil came into being, if he's a, if, 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 or if hell's real. All that stuff is just secondary and if you, if you leave that center of this is about you and God and venture off into these other things and you minor in these, these major in these minors, you'll start losing 
what it's really truly about. And you don't want to do that. So it's a basically a revelation of God and us. Now, the Bible is vital. Now, I think I'm in my notes now. The, vi the Bible is vital to the church in preaching and teaching, but the Bible is not one with God. It does not proceed from God, and it is not the fourth member of the Trinity. If God wants to show himself and show us humans what he is like, and to make clear to, in whose image we are made, to show us what it means to be God and what it means to be human, can he do it through a book? That's a tall order for, for a book. Right? Or does he do it through sending a person himself called Jesus? Would you, ra would you rather me be up here as a person talking or having to read a book that you don't understand half of what's even being said? And then we can debate. Well, if there's a person here, it's easier to understand a person than a book. And look what we've done to this book. 40,000 different denominations because of what this book has done. Because, again, they're not being Christological and Christocentric and making it about Christ. They've divided because they're making it about rapture. They're divided because they're making it about tongues as initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They're divided because well, tongues ain't even nothing no more. Because that went out in the old days. Healing's not. And we just keep breaking, breaking it, d dividing and dividing on and on. Where you can believe what you want to believe, I can believe what I want to believe, and we'll say, hey, I may change someday to where you're at, or you say, well, I may change to where you're at. I can't see where you're coming from. I can't see where you're coming from, but it's minor. The main thing is keeping it about Jesus, because I don't think we, none of us, knows God fully. And our, although we're known fully by Him, we don't fully know Him, and that's more important than debating these theories. And all they are are theories. Because you can give me a guy that's smart. I can give you a guy that's smart, smarter than both of us. And for 2,000 years, they haven't come to the conclusion of which is really right. So are we going to do that here? Or are we going to say, okay, I, I see where you're coming from, but I, I can't. I, some of this stuff that I'm teaching... Ten years ago, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have been able to grasp. It took time. It took um, revelation. It took, and, I, and I'm not an easy sell, by the way. I'm not. I'll see something someone says, and I'm like, okay, I, I, I just can't jump on board with that. I, I need more evidence. I've, I've listened to guys, and they've given their treaties on a certain doctrine. I'm like, I see where you're coming. Not convinced me of what you just said. Maybe because you're a poor teacher. Or maybe I'm just too stupid to understand where you're coming from. And then you know what it took? Listening to somebody else do it in a way that I could understand it. Using scripture the other guy didn't use. And I'm like, well, had he said that, that makes all the sense in the world. And this is, how, this is just how life is. This is how learning is. All right? So we just can't throw babies out with the bath water. we got to just say, okay, I, I'm, if someone comes to me with an off-the-wall I want to check it out. I don't have to swallow it hook, line, and say, I'm going to okay, put it on the shelf. I don't know. Maybe that heresy one day will be truth that liberates me. Which it really wasn't heresy, but I maybe thought it was. All right, does that make sense? So Christ alone is the eternal word of the triune God, as such reveals his Father, and then unveils the true meaning of the Scriptures as pointing to him. Hebrews 4.12, is that the first one? I'm going to really try to stay to my notes. So I, I mean, I'm going to read these because if I don't, I, I'm just, I'll be all, I got so, there's just so much to say and I just don't have the time to say it. That, was that the first one? Mm -hmm. All right, look at this scripture. Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is living. Now what is the word of God? The word of God is living Jesus. and powerful. So you can't tell me it's the book. Jesus. The book is not living. Paul will tell you in 2 Corinthians 3, the letter of the law does what? Kills. Kills. It's a ministry of condemnation and death. This, this is not, and we were brought up when we read that. Word of God is living, powerful, sharpened into it. And they would hold the Bible up. 
Because they equated this to Jesus. Okay? So the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now, if you don't believe that, here's where translations or trans translators will hit the next verse, and between verse 12 and 13, they might even put in there as a heading the Bible as, your, as a sword. The Bible is the sword. All kinds of different things that humans put in there. But we're, we're, this is not human here. I'm not putting anything in there. Next verse. This, I'm going to tell you what the Word of God is. So put it all in context. Next verse is, And there is no creature hidden from His sight. Wait, now who not? We go from the Bible to a hymn. In verse 12, you're telling me that the Bible is sharper than any two-edged sword. And then you tell me that those creatures hidden from His... No, it should be, And there's no creature hidden from the sight of the Bible. If, if the context and the theme is, is the Bible in verse 12, how do you switch gears all of a sudden and start talking about Him if you weren't talking about Him already in verse 12? So he's saying Jesus is that living Word, the Logos. And there's no creature hidden from Jesus' sight who is the, the speaking Word of God. But all things are naked and open to the eyes of Him. Not the eyes of the Bible. The eyes, look, everything's naked and open to Him. Remember what it says, the, the Word is sharper, two-edged sword, dividing soul and spirit, and is a discerner of the intents. Go back to it. Twelve. Discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Next. Go back. And then he says, the open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. So he's the only one. The word, the speaking word, Jesus, the Logos, the eternal Logos, is looking into your heart and he knows the thoughts. This Bible doesn't know the thoughts and the intents of the heart. It doesn't have eyes, right? So he's talking about Jesus in verse 13, which means he's talking about Jesus in verse 12. And look at the next verse. Then he talks about Jesus being the high priest. So he, so, next verse. That's it, 14. Okay, seeing then that we have a great high priest, all right, who's passed through the heavens. So he's saying Jesus is the living word. Jesus is the, the one who, all, every, no, no one's hidden from his sight, but he sees all. And then he's the high priest who's passed through. This is all about Jesus. This isn't Jesus for two verses in the Bible for one verse. You put it in context, it's talking about Jesus. Does that make sense? So clearly the scriptures are pointing to testifying of the person of Jesus. And we must reorient from the Bible to Christ. Simple as that. We have to reorient from the Bible to Christ back to the Bible. There's a lot of people reading this to prove their doctrines. A lot of people reading this and they divide from the, what they, they're looking for. Jesus isn't divided. So what i got to do is say, put this Bible down, and let me get this revelation that Jesus is the center, the Locos, L-O-C-U-S, the center of, um, of everything. Now I can go back to the Bible, and now i got to now read with Him in view. Always with Him in view. Nothing else with Him in view. And you, when you get to the doctrines, the doctrines have to pass mustard with the nature of God, that we find who God is by looking at who? Jesus. Jesus. So scriptures now, so we, re we reorient from the Bible back to Christ, back to the Word of God, and scriptures become the map or an inspired compass rather than the destination. Then when you look at the writers of the Bible, the, the Old Testament, the writers, the narrations, the events we read, the historical things that took place, all together the Holy Spirit is employing to direct us to the person of Jesus. That's what the Spirit is going to do. He's, when the Spirit comes, He's going to unveil Jesus. He's not going to do anything else. So when you have the Holy Spirit helping you read the Bible, He's not going to tell you about anything except Jesus. Now you can make that Bible say all kinds of things, but if you really want to keep it the way Jesus told us and taught us how to read it and how the Spirit's going to aid us, and then it's got to be about Jesus. We read the Bible to see and know Jesus. 
Now, most people, now I'm at the Christocentric view on your outline. Most read the Bible as a flat text. Now, what do I, what do I mean by reading the Bible as a flat text? Where every word has equal authority. That's, a, that's reading it as a flat text. That means if it says in the Bible, God kills, okay, um, in Psalms 137 or 130, I don't know, somewhere, Psalm says that we are to take Babylonian babies before they grow up to be men and come and kill us, let's take these babies and smash their heads on rocks. Okay? Now, when you read that, reading it by way of a flat text, you're going to read that with the same equality that Jesus is going to come along and say, love your enemies. So, somebody's telling us to smash babies up against rocks, and Jesus is saying, no, we don't do that. We, we don't kill. We, don't, we love. Now, are those equal texts? If they are, walk away, because it's, it's contradictory, and who knows what's going on. And Jesus is not telling you the truth. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So what we've got to do is make Jesus a separate God from the Father. And then that would make perfect sense, wouldn't it? So here's, here's a God called the Father. And he tried the law. He tried to beat people up. And it never could get those people to listen to him. So here comes the second God. Now this is some heresy from the, from the early, early church. I'm, I'm not making this up. This is true. This is, this is heresy. So this first God blew it. He tried. He beat everybody up and they couldn't get anybody to do anything he wanted them to do. Then comes the second God, Jesus, who said, we're going to do it love's way. We're going to forgive. And he fixes the first God. That would make sense. Except then you'd be into serving more than one God. And that would screw up the Trinitarian view. And the Trinitarian is they're all three what? In one. So you have a dilemma here. And so we fought that. I didn't, but our early church fathers fought that heresy because they fought for the deity of Jesus. That Jesus and God are one of the same essence, yet distinct, and yet one. So you can't read the Bible as a flat text. You can't say where God says, go kill, and then Jesus says, thou shalt not kill. Hate your enemies. Don't only hate them, take their babies and throw them up against rocks. And then Jesus says, oh no, we love our enemies. We forgive those who abuse us and do all kinds of manner evil against us. So, you, so, so the Old Testament can't really be equated with the New Testament if you're going to read it as a flat text. Something's wrong. We got, we got, and the, what we're teaching is the answer. As far as I'm, I'm concerned, or we're, we're in trouble. So that's flat text. Second one, this is on your outline. So the flat text where every word has equal authority... Progressive revelation where all the words accumulate in a crescendo of consistent truth. What, what that might mean, and again, I'm, I'm guessing from what I'm understanding it, is that, it's a, it's that God's evolving. He was a mean God in the Old Testament, but he decided he's going to change. And so it's a, it's, it's a progression. It's an evolution. Now he's a good God. And so, but the problem is, God doesn't change. I'm the Lord that changeth not. Right? He's forever the same today, yesterday, and forever. So that, that, that's not working. He's not learning as we go along. <laughs> that didn't work. Let's try something else. Well, he's all-knowing, so he knows the end from the beginning. That don't work either. So what people are doing, they're painting themselves into a corner if they don't go the route we're going. I don't see any, any other way to to do this or we're going to paint ourselves in a corner and then people aren't going to listen to us because we, we won't have any answers. They'll see the contradictions that, uh, that we hold. So progressive revelation. And then the problem with that is if he's a mean God, but he's growing, in, you know, old, the older he gets, the more loving he is. Then his son comes along and becomes the love that he should have been. But the problem is those two hook up together in the end times called the book of Revelation. And they start kicking butt again, throwing babies up against rocks. Because he's going to kill two-thirds of mankind. Plagues and famine. You'll read the book of Revelation if you read that literal. It's going to mess you up. So we're like, wait a minute. An evil God turns good when Jesus shows up, but somehow maybe the evil God 
makes Jesus evil with him because when they get to the end and you read the book of Revelation, we're back to Old Testament stuff. No, I can't do that. And I don't think anybody with a sensible mind, common sense, will be able to do it either. So that's the progressive revelation. No, it's not a flat text, and it's not a progressive revelation. It's a Christocentric view, meaning this, where Christ is the pinnacle of revelation, and every word must finally submit to him. Underline that. Every, not, not scriptures aren't equal in authority. Every scripture has to now pass mustard with Jesus. And if it doesn't, then you have to allegorize it. You have to spiritualize it. All right, so let's do that. Can I give you one how to do a little, a little, little exercise here? So let's talk about the Babylonian babies. All right, we know Jesus would never take little babies. You know, that's, that's, where, where, where are we going today? We, I must go through Samaria. Why? We're going to gather up every little baby we can, and we're going to go to a well, and they, in the Old Testament, they busted their heads against rocks, but we're going to drown all these babies in Jacob's well. That, do you see Jesus? That, that, I'm being ludicrous. Okay? But the God of the Old Testament was throwing babies up against rocks. Jesus wouldn't do that. So how do, So again, since I can't take that literal because it doesn't pass muster with who? Jesus. Jesus. I have to allegorize the babies and the rocks. How do I do that? Okay? Hmm? Put Jesus in it. Put Jesus in it. So what is... Okay, so what I say is if I can't take something literal, if I can't take it literal, because then it's it, then it, it doesn't it's not matching the father's not matching Jesus. So then the, the 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 Old Testament or the early church says spiritualize it, allegorize it. So who are the babies? Right? So who who are we smashing? So I have to spiritualize that. We're not talking about um human humans. What we're talking about, what in my life have I given birth to that's evil, that's ugly? I gave birth to this, this addiction, this, this bad thing that by being darkened in my understanding, what, what does James tell us? How does, see, how does sin get what? Conceived. What's that language? How you're giving birth to sin. Every sin is your baby. Okay? And so every baby, everything we've birthed into this life that's not God, has to be taken, and you could say throw it against the rock, but that rock is who? Christ. Christ. So that means He's the rock of offense. He's the rock either He falls on you, and which is the cross, and kills all that old man mentality, and everything you have in your darkened understanding gave birth to little things in your life that's out there screwing your life up and everybody else's, we now can see that what he's saying is that when, when we go through the cross, Christ is that rock, the cross, and therefore those things, the old man is dead. We can't give birth to those things because the rock killed all the sin. He delivered us from our sins. Does that make sense? So because I can't go kill babies now, I have to, and that's how you would spiritualize the rock and the Babylonian babies. Now I didn't plan, I, I could probably wax a little bit more eloquent on that, but I wasn't planning on doing that. I'm just giving that the way that I would see that, the way that I would understand that. And there's probably guys who could say it better and maybe put a little bit of a better of a twist on it. But you get the idea, right, of what do I do with that verse? So if somebody comes up to you and says, hey, I didn't know God was into throwing babies up against the rocks. I'm like, what? Yeah, here, let me show it to you. What are you going to say? Uh, yeah, that's your God. And you stand there dumbfounded. Probably that guy you were talking about would use something like that. And What do you say? The atheists know the Old Testament better than the Christians do. And they know these scriptures, and they're using them on our youth and they have nothing to stand on. And God is this evil man because they don't know what, we're, what we've been teaching for the last eight weeks. Anyway, I don't know. I took a side sidebar there. Not every word of Scripture aligns with the living word of God. That's on your outline. Not every word of Scripture aligns with Jesus who is the living word of God, Hebrews 4.12. 
Now look at the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus, we, we looked at this about several weeks ago, but this repeat's important here. On the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus makes statements like, you have heard it said. And what is he referring to? These people were Old Testament scholars. So they knew what the Old Testament said. You've heard it said, like for instance, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. But he, but he said, he'd come back and say, but I say to you. I know what the Old Testament, can, and I'm sitting there thinking as I'm, I'm meditating on this today, I'm sitting there thinking, you imagine, Jesus is God, right? He's the Son of God, He is God, and we know He read the Old Testament, because even in the temple, you see, He opened up Isaiah and said, this scripture has been fulfilled in your sight. But can you imagine Him reading the Babylonian babies thrown up against rocks? Or what Samuel says to Saul, go kill all the Amalekites, the women, and all that. Jesus had to go, oh my God, they don't know you. And he would never ever cite any of that. He never ever said, hey, we're going after the Samaritans today. Get, 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 get your swords, get your weapons. They did some bad stuff to Israel and the old Jews in the old days, and we're going after them. Or hey, at least they're not worshiping God at the right place. We're going to, we're going to do a beat down on them. Never know. Not going to happen. So Jesus would say, you've heard it say. He could also, you, you, you've been practicing this. How do I know that? He says, because you say, thou shalt not kill. But I say to you, that if you, look, if, 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 you would, if you hate your brother, you've committed murder. So now he's not saying, I'm not, I'm, he's going into practice. Not what you heard, but now I'm in your practice, you look upon a, a, a woman with lust and you've committed adultery. I didn't like hearing that. So he's... He's, he's changing some things. He's, he's, he's not... He's, it, so he's himself. He's showing us. You can't read flat text where all scripture is equal. Because no, it's not an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. It's turn the other cheek. So these guys come back to him in Mark chapter 10. Do I have that? So this is not a progression. By, remember that's the other way? It's a progression? No. Because Jesus is correcting where they're coming from. So he's not progressing in theology. He's correcting where they've missed it. Okay? Do I have that? Okay, now look at Mark 10. The Pharisees came and asked him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Testing him. Now what? This is... Check this out. And he answered and said to them, Jesus answered and said to them, What did Moses command you? He's going to take them to the Old Testament. Alright? They said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and to dismiss her. Now before you, you got to understand, these guys were divorcing their wife over anything and everything. Like Malcolm, Malcolm teaches this really well. He says even if they burnt the food, he'd be, burnt food, he's writing her a certificate. There you go. Out. Get out. Now where are they going to go? This is a common practice. So, this is the Pharisaical mind. And so they come to him. Let's read it again now. The Pharisees came and asked him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Testing him. And he answered and said to them, What did Moses command you? They said, they know the Old Testament, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and to dismiss her. Moses said, Well, let's go back. Don't, don't leave there. Go, go to John 8. And what did Moses say about catching a woman in adultery? What does Moses say? Stoner. But what does Jesus say? No. See, he's correcting something that was wrong. All right? Now, well, let's get back to divorce. Next. And Jesus answered and said to them, Because of the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept. Now, what's that mean? Moses was writing out of hardness of heart. They weren't writing out of the nature of God, the nature of the Lamb. This was um, making up rules and laws for the evil that man already was in his fallen state. Okay, what about the eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth? That, he, he's not going to say love and forgive their fault, they're, they're not, they don't have that grid. These are fallen humanity. He can't say this till Jesus comes, who writes it where? In the heart. 
on your heart. So what God has to do is give them evil rules and laws, which they make up half the time anyway, but God's... For instance, look at... Do you know... My God, you realize how many laws are on the books in the United States. They never take them off. True. They keep adding laws. There's interracial laws in certain states. Still. So, they don't take them off. They just keep adding them and adding them. And, 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 and the bottom line is, the, the normal man commits three felonies a day and he doesn't even know it. So I heard. Because we're, we break laws that aren't really laws anymore, but they're still in the books. And if they really wanted to come after us, that's probably one of the reasons why they keep them. So, what, what can we get on this guy? I don't know. But... So are these rules in the United States godly? Some may be Christian, Christian Judeo. They might come a little bit from the Bible. For instance, you don't murder. You don't rape. You don't, unless God tells you to in the Old Testament, then you, you're allowed to. Right? Yeah. But some rules that aren't good, that aren't right, but they're the best that we can come up with for an evil generation. Because you just can't say, stop, stop killing. That doesn't work, does it? So God says, look, I've got to curtail these evil people. They will, they will, they'll, they'll genocide them, their, their own selves if I don't give them some type of rule, a law of rule in their fallenness. So I give them eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Why? Well, I mean, for instance, we've got to be fair. If you, if you come and you steal a horse, I should be able to go take your horse. If you, if you, if you steal my horse, I've got to be equal in what I get back from you. You can't steal my horse, and I come and murder your wife. That's what they would want to do. I'll go for the juggler in your life, you know. So, you do with that with what you want. Again, it's a theory. But watch this. He wrote and said, hey, the hardness of heart that he wrote you this precept. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and join to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one, meaning God's intent is that they never divorce because then they would be two again, not one. But because men, harden, and this is what Jesus is saying, so then they are no longer two, but one flesh, and therefore what God has joined together, that's God's intent. That's spirit. But you guys are flesh, and that's why Moses wrote out of hardness of heart. <laughs> <laughs> not out of the nature of God. Here's the nature of God. No, you don't divorce because of two. Now, this ain't, this ain't condemning people, okay, because Jesus didn't come to condemn, that he came so that we might have life in him and be awakened to who we are in Christ. And if the two are awakened to who they are in Christ, they probably won't divorce anyway, right? Do I have another one or is that it? Mm, that's it, Psalms. All right, does that make sense? So, when we read the Bible, when anything in the rest of the Bible disagrees with Jesus, listen to Jesus. When Moses the law and Elijah the prophet, Moses on the Mount, Transfigura Mount of Transfiguration, Moses represents the law, Elijah represents the prophets, and then you've got the law and the prophets, and that's what the whole Old Testament is about. They're there talking to Jesus. I know we already said this, but I'm just reiterating this. God comes down from heaven and says, you do not listen to the law. This is not about Moses. One greater than Moses has come. And then, you don't listen to the prophets. And who do we listen to? So now Jesus has to interpret Moses. And when Moses and Jesus don't line up, who wins? Who trumps? Jesus. That's all I'm saying. And I think, to a degree, we do that. And here's how. We just ignore the scripture that says, throw little babies up against rocks. We just ignore it. I don't know, you know. That's back. That's old covenant. No, you can't. You can't say that. Okay, you got to do something with it. So the law and the prophets. Why does Why does God say to Moses and Elijah, that, or to Peter and him, "This is my beloved son. Listen to him," because the law and the prophets pointed to who? Jesus, Jesus is the fulfillment of everything Moses was saying. And Jesus is the fulfillment of everything the prophets were saying. So I don't know what they were talking about on the Mount of Transfiguration, but you've got to understand what's happening here. Here God is, is letting the law and the prophets 
point to Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. The law and the prophets are pointing to Jesus. And what does Peter and them do? Oh, let's make a tabernacle for all, for all three of them. And it's like, no, see, that, that's the problem. They point to Jesus. Now we're, we're not done with the Old Testament because we still let it point to Jesus. But Jesus trumps law and prophets. You never use, I'm ready for this, you never use the, the Bible, the Scriptures, to correct Jesus. So you can't, and here's, and so nobody does that. Yeah, they do, and this is how they do it. Slick little what people they are. You say something, yeah, but the, but the Bible said. Now they're using the Old Testament to correct Jesus when they go, yeah, but. What about this scripture? What about that scripture? And see, they, 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 they know what you're saying about Jesus, but, ah, yeah, but. And then, and then what? We're going to let the Old Testament correct Jesus? And then we go, well, I know it says that. And then who won the debate? Because Jesus says this, and your buddy's taking you to the Old Testament, says that, and now we're reading it from a flat text, and they both have equal authority. No, no, no. Jesus corrects it all. You never use something to correct Jesus. And really, that's common sense, but they do it with their butts. But this, what about that? Okay? Psalms 119, 105. This is like the lamp, the, the, the living, the Hebrews 4.12. Now look at this one. I was taught all my life, this is the Bible. Uh, Amy Grant, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. That's the Bible. Is it? Is that what it is? Psalm 119, 105. We, we were taught that, that the Bible is a lamp unto my feet. This scripture is not it's it it points to Jesus who who's the light is the bible the light or is the person a light so the the word is the eternal logos Jesus is a lamp to my feet what do you tell people that don't have a bible what do you tell people that are illiterate who don't know I don't know what the rate of illiteracy is globally Anybody know what it is in America? I'm sure it's low, but there are people that don't know how to read. Somehow they got through school, but they don't know how to read. But globally in third world countries, how is the Bible a lamp to the feet? I guess only the rich and the intelligent get to have Psalm 119 fulfilled in their life. Okay? It's not doesn't work that way. You you realize that we didn't even have a canonization of scripture for the first 300 years or so where we had the the well we didn't have the 66 books which was really 80 books they, they shaved it down to 66 but that was clear on down but the first couple hundred years these are just things floating all over the place we really didn't have a Bible that's a lamp to my feet what about that generation that didn't have a Bible because one didn't exist they had the Septuagint Guess you could have used that, but they didn't have no new. Death. They were just they were parchments all over the place. So, but you got to look and say that this is Jesus is a lamp to my feet and a light because we know who the light is. Jesus comes and says, "I'm the light." He's allegorizing this when he says, "I'm the light," not any words. I'm the light and the lamp unto your feet. Not not the Old Testament. Okay. If we're going to be honest, there are a lot of passages in the Bible that are unChristlike. Deuteronomy 20, 21. Number, we're not going to look at those. They're there for you to look at. And Jesus, and we looked at all that too. So let's go down to reading the Bible with Jesus' lens. John 5, 39. i got to hurry up. Jesus says, I know we know this. Study, you study the Scriptures diligently, diligently, because you think that in them you might have a life, you might have eternal life. These Scriptures, these are the very Scriptures that testify about me. So he's saying to them, it's about me. Okay? So, if Jesus is saying something, and they don't agree with it, and they want to cite an Old Testament passage, who's trumping here? Jesus. He says, no, you're going back to them as if it's the fourth member of the Trinity. 
The, by, the, the scriptures didn't proceed from God out of heaven and became incarnate with the eternal logos did, which is the living word. It's the it's the light. It's the lamp unto your feet. Um. So watch what he says here. Now that's the verse. Now let's put this in context real quick. And we're out of time. Go next next one. Verse thirty six. I have now. This is him speaking, saying something before the verse we just looked at. I have testimony weightier. Jesus says, I have testimony weightier than that of John. Who's John? John the Baptist, the last of the prophets. For the works that the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I have done. Now look, he's saying, I have a testimony that's weightier than John. For the works that the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I am doing, testify that the Father has sent me. And the Father who sent me has himself testified concerning me. You have never heard his voice nor seen his form. I'll leave it there. Jesus is going to show you something that he says there are four... Let's just read the next verse. Let's put it in the context. Then. Nor does his word dwell in you. So you haven't heard his voice, you haven't seen him. And his word... Wait, what? Nor does his word dwell in you? He just, told, he just affirmed that their reading the scriptures were done diligently. They have memorized the scriptures, phylacteries on their forehead. They took the Bible very, very, very serious. And he even said, you search the scriptures diligently. And yet he says, nor does his word dwell in you. Is that scripture or is that Jesus? He will dwell in them. After the resurrection, when the Holy Spirit comes, but he's he, he, again, for you do not believe the one he sent you. Study the scriptures diligently. You study this now, 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 now we're in context now. You study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me. Now let's go back to the other two verses. He says, I have testimony waiting. Now look at what his testimony is. John the Baptist gives him weight because John says, There's the Lamb of God. Right? The Father gives him testimony because he says, I'm doing the works that the Father has given me to do. And if you don't believe me, believe the works that I, that I, that I do. And the Father who set myself testified concerning you have never heard this voice. And then the next verse that he says, the scriptures testify of him. So he's telling you the things that are testifying of who he is, that he is the eternal Logos. He is the Word of God. Okay, because John points, out, po points him out, Scripture's point him out, God points him out. And um, so we've got the prophet John, God the Father, the deeds of Jesus, and the Jewish Scriptures point to him. Four things there. You see that on your outline. So seeing Scripture, now watch, seeing Scripture instead of Jesus as the point ensures that we will not hear the voice of God in the Scriptures or in their hearts. What's he say? Go back, go back to the other two, the other two verses. He says, the word does not dwell in you. And then go to, so the word doesn't dwell in them. Go, go, go to the other, the other two. And then he says, um, you have not heard his voice nor seen his form. So when you read scriptures wrong, you don't hear his voice. You don't see who he is. And then what's the next one? Go back to, over again. Um, and I had all these together at the same time. What's the other one? John 16. No, that's the last one. And um, But you'll miss Jesus because they testify of him. So you miss seeing him, you don't hear him, because you're looking at the scriptures wrong. You're not looking at the scriptures with a Christocentric view. And I'm going to tell you right now, most of the church doesn't. Now, here's an exercise to do to prove me wrong. Next time you listen to somebody on YouTube or you go to another church and listen to what the guy's saying and he will use the word Jesus about two or three times. But the rest is about what he's trying to convey to you or what he wants you to do. If he's building the kingdom, which most do, you're going to hear, you're going to hear a lot about money and you're going to hear a lot about volunteering. Why? Because we need money to keep the machine going and we need volunteers. And so they'll, they'll engineer script, they're in, they'll engineer sermons and, and, and they're slick, man. But if you're look, if you're if, if you know the playbook, 
You can pick up right off. You can get. You can go. I know where he's going with this. I know. I know exactly where he's going with this. I see it all the time. I'm not making this stuff up. And yeah, I'll throw, he, yeah, but he said Jesus a few times. That doesn't mean anything. What are sermons supposed to be about? Money. Is it supposed to be about getting volunteers? What are we supposed to be teaching? Let's go, let's turn. I'm going to a couple scriptures. Um, Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4. But I want you to just do it and get, watch TV, Christian television and see, and you're going to go, man, you'll hear these faith teachers and, and do an hour on prosperity, and probably they, they've done this. I'm not making this up. They've done this. And they've listened to several sermons from the dude in Houston. It's got a 20,000 member church. And they said the man did the whole message and never, and never said Jesus one time. So do you think that, that that sermon was Christocentric? Huh? How many times do you think I said Jesus tonight? <laughs> now what are what sermons for? What, what, what are we doing here? Number one, to unveil Christ in you, Galatians 1, 15, 16. Paul says it's all about who's in you that needs to be unveiled so you know who you are in him. But look what it says here in Ephesians 4. There's a five-fold ministry going on right now. And these are the gifts that God has given us. And um, look at verse 11. And he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers. Why? What are they going to be doing? Preaching and teaching. Jesus. Right? For the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ. Right? That's Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. We ain't even close to the knowledge of the Son of God, let alone the unity of the faith. That's what messages and sermons is building us up in Christ, creating a unity of faith and getting a knowledge of Him. Not trying to get you to work for the church. If you don't want to work for this church, don't work for this church. You don't want to give? You don't, you don't got to give? Because it's not about... Paul had the same problem in Corinthians. He says, look, I'll give it to you for free. You know what? You don't want to give... I will glory in the fact that I'm giving it away for free. Never let it be about money that you don't learn about Christ. Okay, you got me here. i got to get on my platform, my soapbox. I hate when people charge to, to, to listen to messages. Freely has been given to you. Freely give, right? So, so now only people that have money can learn about Jesus. Well, how do you fix that? You just say for an offering. And then you say to the people that really have a lot of money, hey, how about giving a little bit of extra for the people who don't have it? You can do that. So you know what? I, I, I was going to give you this amount, but I'm going to give you, because you're giving it away for free, and people don't have the money, and we do believe in sowing into the teacher, Galatians 6, 6, but we're not demanding that. You, you want to you wanna volunteer? Volunteer. If you don't, I... I'd rather you not do it if you're going to do it with, a, with an attitude. Paul says if you're going to give out of, necess out of necessity, you're going to give grudgingly. And what does he like about givers? That they be what? Cheerful. Cheerful. So Paul's saying if you're going to give grudgingly, keep it. My God, don't, don't. Here, take it. No, hurry up before I change my mind. No, I don't know. I don't want that. I don't want that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Listen to what's being preached out there. I don't even take up an offering. I don't pass a plate. Do I? No. Have you ever seen me pass a plate? Maybe in the big building back in the day, a long time ago. Never did pass. I didn't? Yes. Oh, there you go. I see I don't even know I don't even have my I don't even remember my past. That was twenty two oh two. That was twenty years ago. So I guess I haven't taken up an offering as far as I know in 20 plus years. We have a plate. You want to give? Give. If not, I, I just, I'm, it is what it is. And, and, and you guys have been great about that. So this is not, this is not a, we are, we're blessed. Let's just put it that way. You guys are great givers. 
But you see what I'm saying. It, messages have to be about Christ, not about anything other than that. All right. So let me let me just. And I, there's a lot here, man. Let's fix a couple. Uh, turn to Second Timothy two fifteen. Five minutes. Five minutes. Two minutes on this scripture, three minutes on the other, we're out. I'm not going to turn there. Somebody read it. 2 Timothy 2.15. I could quote it, but I want you to read it because I, I want to show you something. What do you got? Be diligent. Present yourself approved to God. Be worker. diligent. Present yourself approved of God. A worker who does A not worker. Who does not need to be ashamed. A worker who does not need to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly dividing the word. Whoa, that's where we stop. Everybody that quotes that doesn't quote it all the way through. So we think that he's talking about rightly dividing the word. Right here, scripture. What's it say? You can, you can check this out in every, every single translation on Bible Hub or Gateway, because they've got translations I don't have. You can look at it in Young's Literal. What, it, what, what was you reading there? Because they all say the same thing, so it doesn't matter what your translation is, but just so people know, what is that? New King James. New King James. All right? They all say the same thing. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Who is the word? Now, let's say it's the Bible. Truth. Well, what's the truth? So the truth is what the... Now, see, it's rightly dividing the message of Jesus. And that's the only thing that matters. How are you going to rightly divide the Old Testament when we have divided 44,000 times? What are we rightly dividing? You can't rightly divide this Bible. It's all theories. Any, you realize that smart guys can talk you out of almost everything you believe? And then if one smarter than him can talk you back into what you used to believe? <laughs> and we're rightly dividing the... No, <laughs> we're not. This is about rightly dividing who Jesus is. Okay? And we know who he is by looking at the God. You can't divide over Jesus. He says, don't murder, don't steal, don't hate. You love, you pray, you forgive. I mean, how do you divide over that? But we do. Believe you me, they do and they will because people that aren't awakened yet are blind to who Christ is. And then we don't, we don't have time to do the rest of this. I, I can't. There's no way I can do the rest of this just, justice. Maybe we'll hit it again. I wanted to read some stuff now, but I got too much stuff. Um, anyway, that's why it, it's just going to take some time. But it's going to be good. It's going to be fun because it's light. I'm not going to get into anything. I hope I didn't get anything that was too much for you. But um, again, say this one more time. This is a huge paradigm shift, and we just can't just gloss over it and leave people. Ah, what? Got okay, now let's go back now and work through this shift that's, that we've gone through. And um, again, I, I, what Brenda says, you're like, ah, and then all of a sudden I'm going to say something. It's going to be one, one teaching. Boom! I see it now. And then you'll be glad we took that time to really develop this thing. But again, all the hard work is over with. Where we're going here is making it practical. I want this Bible to come alive in Christ when it's interpreted. And you, if this thing's done right, you will not refer to this as a Bible. If you see this thing right, you will refer to it as the sacred text. And it's like, oh, wow, well, even though God, they say he threw babies up against rocks. No, 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 I can allegorize that. That's even better now. Yeah. Let the rock fall on all my babies out there that I've created from my darkened understanding. Um, and we can do a lot with, with all that, which I hope, hope we get into that in the, in, the, in the time to come. But anyway, any questions or comments? One thing I'll share. Mm -hmm. A couple years ago, God showed me in prayer the first word of the Bible is in. The last word is amen. Say that again. The very first word is in. The very last word is amen. And everything in between is Christ Jesus. Is, yeah. In. Yeah. That's cool. In Christ Jesus, amen. Yeah. 
Yeah. Good stuff. That's that that says it right there. Talk about simplifying it. Yeah. Anything else? Father, we bless you and thank you so much. We just glorify you. We we just are humbled by the genius of the text. And the Holy Spirit is our teacher to lead and guide us into all truth. This, this, this sacred text is to be spiritually discerned. We didn't get into those scriptures, but we, we discern the sacred text by the Spirit. So we, we spiritually discern, not with our mind, but with the Spirit and our hearts, so that when we read the sacred text, something's burning within us. Did we not sense? Did, did not the scriptures, Karl Barth would say, like a beast came out and grabbed me and wrestled me. I'm undone. That's what the text, sacred text does. Because it's Christocentric and it's about Christ. Thank you, Lord. Continue to open our eyes, the understanding of our hearts, the eyes of our understanding, giving us a spirit of revelation of Jesus Christ. Amen.